Welcome to Stranger Things in the 1980s. My name is Vince Locke. I am your host. In this podcast, my guest and I take deep dives into the Upside Down, where we analyze each episode of the Netflix series, along with related movies and books, and examine them in the context of 1980s America. Today's returning guest is Brian Stout, who is here to help me discuss literary criticism in Chapter 5, The Flea and the Acrobat. Welcome back, strangers, to Stranger Things in the 1980s. I'm joined once again by my friend Brian. Uh, I don't know, Brian, do you want to reintroduce yourself? I, I think our listeners probably sure. know you fairly well now. Yeah, just on the off chance. Um, so I'm Brian Stout. I'm actually located near Hawkins in Bloomington, in Indiana. And I am just similar to Vince, a pop culture enthusiast, occasional teacher, blogger, writer, and then my day job is building training. So, um, and of course, I'm a Stranger Things fan and all these references as well. Awesome. So this episode is going to be a little bit different in that there's not a special topic connected to the 1980s. We're going to focus on Chapter 5, which is the Flea and the Acrobat. But before we get into that, I do want to have a sort of a, a mini lesson on literary criticism. So how does that sound to you? Sounds good. To, to keep that 80s momentum going, you know, of course, my one of my favorite things in the entire world was Siskel and Ebert in the movies or any variation of the way that shows. Na uh, names changed all the time. So I right. came at most of this from kind of reading a lot of film criticism, and watching the shows, but I developed that mindset pretty early and then you know, went into school and went, oh, wow, you can do this with other stuff too. Right. <laughs> now, there are nine basic sort of categories of literary criticism. I mean, really, it, you could divide them into just two, because if you go back and look at so the history of criticism, it really originates with the ancient Greeks, especially with Plato and Aristotle. So Plato wasn't really a big fan of art because he felt that art was was essentially a lie and, and by the way i'm going to be really oversimplifying some of these concepts in here <laughs> so for plato he was all about interacting with the world in its purest form which for him the world could only be apprehended through pure thought so the idea of the platonic ideal goes back to the idea that the truest form of a thing can only be apprehended, like I said, in the mind. And so for him, he wasn't a big fan of art and especially poetry. He, he really kind of turned his nose up at poetry because it was for him two steps removed from reality because language was an interpretation of reality. When you reduce things to language, you lose something in the translation. And when it comes to poetry or writing stuff down, that's, again, two steps removed from the purity of the reality, because not only are you translating it through the medium of language, but then you're taking that language and then you're changing it and altering it by writing it down. So for the Platonists, the idea of art is that it is hiding something. And so you need to be able to 
take the art apart in order to get to the real truth. And then for Aristotle, who was Plato's student, Aristotle said, well, no, the purpose of art is to bring about a form of catharsis because it creates a simulation of reality that people can interact with in a way that is socially safe and therefore they could purge themselves of any sort of negative emotions or desires through interacting with the art. So again, platonic criticism focuses on the text or the, the creative work as being uh, a cipher or hiding truth, whereas Aristotelian criticism focuses on the effect that the creative work has on people. You with me so far? Are you asking me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, yes, I think it makes sense. Uh, and yeah. actually, I, I should probably be asking that of the, the wider audience. Are you with me so far? <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully we haven't lost. Hopefully, hopefully nobody's clicked away or dozed off. I mean, I think just to kind of put that in another way, I think one of the things that, like a couple of the angles that I've always kind of or been asked to tackle criticism, uh, you know, are are really just to look at the thing itself and just criticize and, and just critique the object, whether that be a you know a TV series or an episode of a show or a film or a song or a record or any of the above or a game or or whatever, and then just look at it strictly on its own merits and maybe compare it to other you know similar things and then mm -hmm. or to or to take it I mean you know and mostly in college it was usually more like this just looking at it in a broader context or or applying it or, or maybe even trying to do something with it that's a unique like taking it in a unique way like um, for example uh, when I was in my undergrad thesis for psychology I looked at the way that psychology and psychologists are portrayed in movies and, you know, probably the first ones that come to mind are ones that are, you know, not the ones you'd want to be your therapist, like Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> I was just guys, thinking Hannibal yeah, Lecter. Or those guys who are running the experiments in Clockwork Orange or like um, those There's kinds a mad of things. science quality to it. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, um, you know, and what I discovered, and I haven't kept up on this, I really probably should have, but um, at the time that I did this study, there was really only, um, I remember distinctly, there was one movie where the therapy, like there was a group therapy context and it was fairly realistic. And the rest of the time, it was just this you know, sensationalized, scary, you know, your therapist really, I mean, basically in a sentence, your therapist either wanted to screw you or kill you basically pretty much every time out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I suppose both things happen in the real world, but definitely not in, in, with the frequency that they do in films especially within the 1980s pop culture i think <laughs> which uh, you do see that represented in stranger things in the way that science is seen in a, a dangerous way as represented by dr brenner of course you do have dustin as being the, the kindly scientific mind i was but. just going to say that we got a we got kind of a battle there yeah right and mr clark and then there yeah. i was just going to say and then their av teacher is sort of helping them along the way yes <laughs> but yeah there is that distrust of science and even you know hopper said that in the the first episode that he he always had a distrust for science so would you consider yourself more platonic or aristotelian i i'd say aristotelian I, the, the platonic stuff doesn't do much for me <laughs> okay I, it feels like it's like a dead end i think <laughs> that's fair in some ways it That's doesn't perfect. feel, it doesn't let me to do, it doesn't allow me to do any of the things that I like to do. It, it would squash most of the conversations that I like to have with my friends about all these things. And, you know, I love picking out the nods to other work and things. Mm -hmm. or one of the biggest gateway pieces for me in getting into music that predated me was to start learning about it in the context in, in which it was created like I remember distinctly being just totally riveted by Ken Burns jazz because I didn't know any of the stories behind any of that music Since I knew about what was going on at the time I began to develop a whole new appreciation for that music another like fun example I think 
like when Almost Famous came out, it got me excited about some older <laughs> music. And then at the same time, VH1 was doing this countdown of the 100 greatest rock albums. You know, of course, they were mostly older. They mostly mm-hmm. predated me. But it was great to, to like learn, you know, what was going on when this album came out. Or it, it sort of helped me sequence it in my head. And then I could start to see how the music that I like, you know, where it had come from in right. some ways. And I really dug that. And we are of that generation where MTV and VH1 still played music. <laughs> That's what they yeah. were known for. Yeah, exactly. I just dated myself for sure. I mentioned VH1 and actual videos. Wow. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's uh, interesting that you mentioned that because two of the critical approaches that we have relied on a lot here in this podcast are historicism and new historicism. Now, at first, I just I want to preface this by saying that I'm using some of these terms in very broad ways. When it comes to criticism, criticism has a negative connotation. And so most people tend to use it in a negative way as in finding fault in something. But from an academic perspective, criticism is a means by which we find the meaning in something. So when we talk about literary criticism, we're talking about analyzing or viewing works of literature in a way so that we're, we're trying to find the meaning that's being conveyed by it. And literature itself is kind of a, an ambiguous term because it's not necessarily referencing you know, the classic works of literature stuff that is written and codified in books, but any sort of creative work whether it be music, film, something that is graphical and we would associate with the visual arts or, of course, literary texts, those books that we put on a pedestal. And so when it comes to literary criticism, there are three basic parts to the equation. There is the writer, there is the reader, and then there is the text. And again, I'm using these terms kind of broadly so the writer is the, the creator of the text. So it doesn't have to be a written text, like I said. And it doesn't have to be a singular writer because in the case of film, for example, you have many people contributing to the creation of that work. So the writer is just a sort of a catch-all term to use when referencing the creators of a specific work that work is the text and again it doesn't have to be a written text it is the creative work that is produced and then for the reader that is the audience or whoever is engaging in the text as the receiver so just to be clear even though i do use these terms reader writer text i'm using them in a very broad way historicism focuses more on the writer part of the equation, whereas new historicism focuses a bit more on the reader part of the equation. So historicism is putting the text into an historical context and viewing how the historical context influenced the development of that text or the creation of it. New historicism looks at the text in multiple ways primarily from the way that the viewer interprets the text and how interpretations change across time and across cultural boundaries. And like I said, those are the critical approaches that we've been doing or using mostly for the most part to the greatest extent uh, in here on this podcast, because of course, we're looking at the 1980s and we're looking at how the 1980s are represented within the various texts that we're looking at. For example, looking at poltergeist in relation to Reaganomics. But also we have to remember that Stranger Things is not a product of the 80s itself. Rather, it is an interpretation of the 1980s from the 2010s, 20-teens. What's the term for that? I don't know. Mm And, and so yeah. it is, from a new historicist perspective, it, it is an emulation of the 1980s, but it's one that is filtered or colored or influenced by the intervening 40 years. So can you think of examples that we have already discussed, or maybe we haven't discussed, of how historicism and new historicism 
work in relation to what we've been talking about? Well, I mean, just in general, this that's really been the one of the critiques of the show, I think, in some ways, is that it's like some people who do level criticism, negative criticism, mm -hmm. I guess would be what I would say. They they say it's just mining the 80s for nostalgia and that it's yes. it's just hitting some of the um like the the notes that we know or that we like the most, like the Steven mm -hmm. Spielberg elements of it. And you know, I think this show that we're doing, I think really, I mean to me it just proves that though to a degree because we're we're pulling in stuff that people didn't really love about the 80s, like Reaganomics, <laughs> and child kidnapping, and all sorts of oh, other things. That's a um, good point. To me, I think one of the things that is really interesting about this, this series is the amount of care that they, they have put into all of these references. There's so many layers to it. And I mean, I think if it was purely like a nostalgia exercise, which some people who don't like it say, I think that they, you know, we, it would just be really surfacey. There's, there are other shows and other, or other things I watch that do seem to just kind of be skim, like skimming the surface for the mm -hmm. sake of nostalgia. You know, look no further than like the endless cycle of remakes of things that we have. And how do you define nostalgia? What is nostalgia? What does that mean to you? Well, I, I mean, nostalgia, you know, always has like a positive connotation right people are nostalgic for things that are negative or things you know things they didn't like you know for me i mean at least that's the way i take it for example i'm you know we just established what age i am a little while ago <laughs> um and and i'm sort of like you know i do keep up with things that are newer but just there's never i doubt i highly doubt at this point there's, there's ever going to be music that replaces the place in my heart that a lot of the 90s music that I listened to mm -hmm. has because that was the period of my time when I was I had the most free time I had the most resources available to it it could really work its way into my DNA where now mm -hmm. the music I listen to now even the stuff that I really really like that I don't already that's new to me is now fighting for attention with yeah. a grown-up job two children uh, all of my neuroses and everything else that's swimming around in my head. Uh, whereas I was kind of carefree and loose in the 90s, hanging out with Vince, grading, you know, reading papers and talking trash about, I don't know, whatever else and goofing on Star Wars and everything else. The, for me, nostalgia is really something that is much more personal, like you're talking about. So nostalgia is a sort of looking back and fondness at something that was important to you at a given point in time. So it's a much more personal thing. Whereas when people talk about, let's say Stranger Things as being just nostalgic, I don't think it is because it's really being created by people who weren't necessarily there at the time. So they're not recreating their experiences. They might mm -hmm. be appealing to other people's personal experiences. As yeah. I, I think there's a difference between nostalgia and being an homage. If you look at, like you mentioned, all of these sort of recreations or reboots of stuff that was popular in the 1980s, that doesn't strike me as being nostalgic. That's more of an homage. So, for example, if you take, like, the book Ready Player One, that strikes me as being very nostalgic because Ernie Klein grew up in the 80s. He's of our generation. And so he is creating something that is drawing upon the things that we have fondness for from that time period. One thing that really annoys me is this trend in video games to create games that use a lot of the techniques from 1980s games, 2D games that use pixel graphics and chip tune music and that sort of thing. Those games really annoy me. And it's because back then, yeah, we played those games because we had to. The technology wasn't there to make anything more sophisticated. Whereas people who did not grow up in the 80s are deliberately making games now that look and sound really shitty just in order to, to make a buck. I don't think that's real nostalgia. 
and, and maybe I'm splitting hairs here. I'm, I'm not sure, but when people, well, I think you're, yeah, I think you're getting onto something really important actually, which is that, and there is a distinction between what you just described mm -hmm. and, and nostalgia to me, because I think that those things that you're describing are aiming for nostalgia. They're counting on you having some kind of nostalgia mm -hmm. for it. And you had a really adverse reaction to it. And I was think, just thinking about how I think the reason that one of the reasons to me that Stranger Things doesn't qualify as nostalgia is because it takes a lot of contemporary storytelling, like our, yeah. a contemporary trends in storytelling right now. Like, for example, the, the, the female characters on Stranger Things yeah. would not have any, they would not have nearly as much to do as they, if this was a, a real, a, yes. quote unquote, real 80s throwback. Yes. Like they would just stand around and the spider would jump on them and they would flip out and go, oh, Steve, save me. I'm thinking so much of like Andy and the Goonies. Like that's mm -hmm. the first thing that comes to mind. They might luck out and get to be like um, Elizabeth Shue in Adventures in Babysitting, but that's pretty like, it's pretty rare that you got that right. in that time period. I think a lot of the films do that too. Like as we, we were talking about remakes and stuff and they tend to just take the basic concept and then mm -hmm. they sort of mess with it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. I think it really, I, in my experience, I feel like it, a lot of that hinges on the strength of the source material. For example, that Hills Have Eyes remake that came out about probably going on 20 years ago, not quite. Um, that one to me was quite successful because it, it was able to really like wed these things that we were scared mm -hmm. of in the 70s to the things that we were scared of and update them for that time frame. So there was like in that point, there was a lot of, I feel like it came out in 2004-ish, which was like Bush 2 era. And so they, like the father was kind of like a Bush 2 type guy. And then his son-in-law was kind of like a, like a liberal, like in, in 2017 terms, they would have called him a cuck or something, but <laughs> you know, that's a whole other podcast. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, and then there's other ones where they just sort of like go, oh, we haven't made one of those in a while. Let's just mm -hmm. make another one. And those often just fall flat. Like they, you got to do something a little more uh, to update it at least a smidge. So I, and I think that's the, the key there. It's not an imitation, rather it is a, a reinterpretation of what mm -hmm. came before. And so that's really the difference between historicism and new historicism. So looking at Stranger Things, we can't really, well, I mean, we could look at it from the historicist perspective, but realize that it is a product of the 2010s and not the 1980s. And so it is an interpretation of the 1980s from the perspective of the 2010s. And that's kind of what new historicism deals with. Okay, here is how the 1980s and those pop culture tropes would be perceived now and why. What has changed through the historical context? How have we developed historically or uh, across cultural lines in order to explain those differences in interpretation? Uh, another critical approach is formalism, and I think this is the approach that most people are really familiar with or, or what they think of when they think about literary analysis, because formalism focuses completely on the textual part of the equation, and it's operating from the principle that the meaning of the text is encoded in it, it's hidden and so you have to decode the text to get to the hidden meaning. So it has that very platonic sense to it. And so you decode the text by looking for patterns, looking for patterns in language, word usage, or imagery. So it focuses on identifying what symbols there are present in the text and explaining what those symbols represent. And we've been doing a fair amount of this in this podcast as well. So can you think of examples? Oh, we've looked at all sorts of different times that some particular item has meant something else. I mean, this one of my favorite lenses is semiotics, and I think it probably falls into this category because we're looking at every little piece mm -hmm. of what is in an image or a text and saying that, you know, the assumption is that everything has meaning and nothing is a quote unquote random choice. And, and so it's, it's kind of fun to unravel it in that, in that degree. 
that that reminds me of like how we've made reference to and i had made a note of it actually for this episode that evil dead poster that keeps popping up in jonathan's room. yes it's there for a reason what does it mean yeah formalism is all about explication so explaining what the hidden meaning is since you mentioned it in this particular episode let's explicate it a little bit what are some of the, the patterns or these symbols that we see in this particular episode you mentioned the well, poster and, and the posters yeah. that we've talked about previously. Yes, those are symbolic. Yeah, there is. Uh, I mean, I mentioned the Evil Dead poster a minute ago, which I mean, it has all sorts of different things that the references. You know, it was a it was a drive-in movie. Those movies, uh, you know, it was actually made. It's a Midwest movie for one thing. Mm -hmm. So it, you know, Sam Raimi is from uh, from the Midden. So there's that. It was a movie that's you know that was set out in the woods it deals with possession there's a lot it's got a yes. lot of overlap between it um, it, it plays on that uh, yeah. that cliche or that trope of the cabin in the woods yep and of course that the whole idea of the woods is relevant to this particular story because of murkwood and essentially the buyer's house is the cabin in the woods mm -hmm. and in fact there are very many visual parallels between their house and the cabin and the evil dead movies and when i think when we talked about this i think i believe it was probably when we talked about episode one or maybe when we were just talking about some of the film references you know it would be totally like it, it's totally on brand for jonathan to be an evil dead fan right because it was a it was a cult movie mm -hmm. or i mean you know it developed a cult audience that had a much different meaning yes. in the 80s than it does now. You know, I think everybody thinks they're a comic book nerd or a this nerd or that nerd. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there was a a much smaller and, you know... It was but, not mainstream. But as yeah. devoted. Yeah, very, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. You know, a movie like Evil Dead was definitely not, like, mainstream. Like, it wasn't something that, mm -hmm. you know, if you went to the movies, like, six or seven times a year, you... You know, Evil Dead probably was not one of those trips <laughs> to the theater. <laughs> and it was banned in quite a few places, too. Yep. Uh, it was a video nasty. Over it was a video UK. nasty. And, and for <laughs> listeners who don't know, there was this term video nasty, which was used in the UK to describe horror films that had graphic violence and gore and were, in many cases, banned because of that. Lest you think the United States had a stranglehold on censorship or <laughs> <laughs> that is true. although although I love the fact that they didn't do the satanic panic for music in the all the devil worship stuff because that seems to really align with America and it's yeah uh, and we'll get to that <laughs> later on down the oh, road. I can't but wait yeah the whole the backward <laughs> messages and and yeah. I don't know about you, but I always wanted to get one of those tape players that would play backwards because I wanted to hear those backwards messages, damn it. Oh, I know it. Yeah. I would. <laughs> Back to some uh, recurring themes and symbols and motifs for this episode. So D&D &D pops up many times, and that's a, a common theme throughout the entire series is the kids and ultimately the creators of the show – view this world through the lens of D, D. you know which is kind of funny now that i think about it because this is exactly what the parents nightmare was right yes. <laughs> <laughs> i mean this is exactly what they were afraid was going to happen mm -hmm. yeah you play D, &D and you're going to be summoning demons and devils and stuff and yeah and demogorgons and that sort of thing. They were and, right. And the, the point is that each of the monsters in each of these seasons are inspired by monsters from D D. So the demogorgon, for example, is a D D monster. So this is the episode where the upside down is really introduced. And the boys relate or view that again from that DD lens because they relate it back to what they call the Veil of Shadows. Although, point of order here, the Veil of Shadows isn't actually from DD. The DD equivalent is the Shadowfell, which is another plane of existence that is a dark reflection of the material plane. The Veil of Shadows actually comes from George R.R. R. Martin and Game of Thrones. Or I'm not sure if it's specifically Game of Thrones, but it's from his collection of stories. That's a mistake on their part. 
or if it's not a mistake, it is something where they, the drawing inspiration from a different source. I'd, I'd be surprised if they were really trying to channel some Game of Thrones because there's yeah. so much. There's, Lord of the Rings, definitely. We've gotten Lord of the Rings oh, or, or yeah. Tolkien references before, but yeah. All, yeah, all over the place. There's plenty mm -hmm. of those. But not so much Martin because yeah. that's, that's not of the time period. I was going to say, I don't think, I mean, I don't know. Somebody will probably correct us on this, but I, I don't think he was extremely popular at that point. Was he? Was he like a well-known author? I certainly did not know of him. So I'm not sure I if he was know. even writing or yeah. publishing at the time. Yeah, I only know of him because of Game of Thrones. So exactly. I might be wrong about his popularity, but that's my impression. In this particular episode, there are two symbols which are highlighted or featured, and they are recurring symbols as well because we've seen them before. And those are Hopper's bracelet and the stuffed tiger. I remember the bracelet because I think it it actually tied into something that that I, that just stuck out for me. Like when he calls his ex wife, yes, and he hears the baby in the background, and, mm -hmm. and that's really the point where he sort of like kicks himself into gear again. You know, it was like a catalyst for him to to try to help and so. we've seen the bracelet before back in the first episode it was highlighted very pointedly when he was in the shower getting ready to go to work uh, on that day in the in the first episode and it's featured or highlighted here in that particular scene that you just mentioned where he is talking to his ex-wife on the phone and he is playing with the bracelet uh while he's talking to her we don't, or it hasn't been revealed yet exactly the significance of the bracelet. Although if you've seen the entire show, then you should know the significance of it. But it is being foregrounded here as being an important symbol for his character. And then there's mm -hmm. the stuffed tiger, because this is the episode in which Hopper breaks into the lab and finds what was Eleven's cell room whatever it is and there's the stuffed tiger on her bed and we know that will had a stuffed tiger as well and we've seen other tiger imagery in other episodes so we got those symbols and those motifs coming back so yeah formalism will focus on identifying those patterns and those symbols and try to interpret their meaning we could do that yeah. now although i think it will pay off more when we get to the end of this particular season to yeah. revisit those symbols and identify what they mean. Yeah. I mean, and that's kind of the fun of, of being a, like at this point of the series where you're, you know, as you're interacting with any piece of art, it's, it's those things will pop up while mm -hmm. you're, while you're engaging with them. And then, you know, the meaning will sort of emerge as you get closer to the end. Right. Yeah, so pay attention to those symbols if, if you haven't already. Another critical approach, which we haven't really talked about much, is psychoanalysis. And this is probably more your area of expertise. Of course, psychoanalysis comes from the theories of Sigmund Freud and the idea that person's behavior is determined by unconscious motives and drives. So you can look at it from the writer's perspective and see the text as an expression of the writer or the creator's unconscious drives and motives. Mm -hmm. You can apply it to the reader part of the equation in order to figure out or determine or make some analysis of a reader's unconscious drives and motives by analyzing the way that they read and what they focus on. Or you can apply it to the text part of the equation in order to determine why characters behave as they do. The problem with that is that a character is not a real person and therefore does not have an unconsciousness. Uh, so the most that you could uh, learn from that perspective is what the writer would think would be the character's unconscious motives. So do you want to speak mm -hmm. to that? I mean, this is one of the places that Freud is, has been, uh, this is one of the ways that Freud has sort of made himself uh, maintain some degree of relevance, right? Because his theories about therapy and people's, mm -hmm. you know, or at least his, his approach to therapy, I mean, that uh, clearly is not in fashion anymore. And there's all sorts of 
criticism of the work that he did that you could certainly dig up. I mean, oh yeah, it's not a psychology podcast, so I'll leave that alone. But, <laughs> but I mean, for me though, it's interesting about Freud is really this kind of stuff where he's digging into people's motivations and drives and and what's under the surface that you may not see or you may not have like what's your your unconscious mm -hmm. and how that's being manifest you know that's where there's some real value still in freud because it's fun to just play around with these things you know i wouldn't advise it for psychoanalysis but i do think <laughs> it's fun to fun to look at and then of course there's comical ways to look at all these things of, you know the sources of conflict that freud saw you know and between parents like with you between a parent and a child or or within yourself you know you know things halls pencils etc mm -hmm. uh, you know. <laughs> i mean but even freud had a sense of sometimes a cigar is just a cigar exactly yeah it's like the original psychology troll i guess right. <laughs> it's kind of like yeah sometimes that is just just the thing that it is. I mean, on a really like basic level, you're the creator of this work, you know, then you're putting it out there in the world and people like Vince mm -hmm. and I will do this kind of stuff to it <laughs> <laughs> and go, Oh, I wonder what's going on with you, huh? Well, let's conflict with the mom there. Huh? And, um, you know, uh, I see your father wasn't present at all. And uh, <laughs> how did that affect you? So we will look at those kinds yeah. of things. So if you pay um, attention to the buyers, for example, the father is a dick. And how has that affected the way his children have developed and why they are outsiders compared to the other characters here? I mean, I was thinking, actually, that kind of plays into one of the things that I had a note about this time from this episode, which is where the dad gets upset or says that Jonathan's evil dead poster was uh, inappropriate. Right. So he's like, casting this judgment upon these kids that he has zero involvement with you know i mean that in itself is kind of an 80s parental trope like there's the the absent father has yes. been around for a minute um but even you know looking at the wheeler family the father is there but the point is repeatedly he's made that he's, out. he's yeah. pretty useless yeah yeah so i guess what the the um, duffer brothers are trying to say is that fathers are fairly useless <laughs> unless yeah unless it's like a surrogate father a la hopper or you know, maybe they have to they have to blow it in order to redeem themselves mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean if you compare eleven's parental father figures here i mean a little bit of a spoiler but you have hopper in relation to dr brenner yeah and, and hopper himself is kind of a hot mess but he's i mean the way i mean you know we were talking about the way that this show seems to borrow heavily from of the moment conventions for storytelling like hopper has a lot more complexity i think than mm -hmm. he probably would have if this was made in like 1984 or 1986 yeah i mean it's, usually you know if you look at movies especially the more sort of horror oriented movies at the time male authority figures especially police officers were presented in really antagonistic ways yeah they often are like reactive and trust their instincts to a degree that winds up hurting them or someone else mm -hmm. I, a lot of the stuff that i've done to psychoanalyze a character so to speak is to really just look at their behaviors and evaluate them in terms of like other theories as well and this does go back to formalism a little bit in that there are three main ways that we come to understand characters, which are what they say, what they do, and what others say about them. But looking back at that psychoanalysis, are there ways that we can apply this to this particular episode? One way that, that kind of jumps out to me is looking at Nancy and Jonathan. What is their relationship like here? Uh, there's a little bit of like a classic, like odd couple. Some of their banter reminded me of like a, like a classic, like screwball comedy. A little of, bit. Yeah. Uh, maybe not so much that it was funny, but just kind of like that antagonistic back and forth, mm -hmm. you know, where he's sort of, you can tell he certainly wishes that she wasn't with Steve and she's kind of defending her choice right. in a lot of that. And she does point out some of his creepier tendencies and, mm -hmm. So yeah, they, they team up here in order to go hunting for 
the thing in the woods, which they don't know what it is at this point. They just know there's something weird out there. What do they do in this particular episode? Because this is not necessarily my favorite episode because there's not a whole lot that actually happens, but there is a lot of talk and a lot of exposition, which is revealed here. We do get some character development. So how are Jonathan and Nancy presented here? Well, I think that, I think that he made some points that maybe got to her a little bit as they were sort of talking to each other. Mm -hmm. I actually agree with you that this is not one of the better episodes. <laughs> I, I When I watched it again the other day, I was like, man, this is kind of boring today. You know, some of the things that, that hit for me with the dialogue were just like the uh, when they do go to the funeral and just those awkward things that we always say at funerals because we don't know what else to mm-hmm. do or say. A couple of lines that were of dialogue that were interesting to me in this episode. And then the one that it jumped out at me that maybe I think has a little more meat to it is when uh, there's the flashback between Joyce and Will and and they're talking about the cartoon that, or the picture that he drew. And then she says, or he says, sometimes bad guys are smart too. Yes. Which I thought was fun. I, I mean, that's, that was interesting because it seems like that's, I mean, that's like a, an element of like some foreshadowing and mm-hmm. also seems to be pointing at Dr. Brenner too. Yes. In, in some ways. And, and then, there is the foreshadowing and that he's drawing fireballs, even though mm-hmm. he doesn't have the right color crayon. Yeah. And which harkens back to that first episode, because when they're playing D&D and they encounter the Demogorgon in the game, he goes to throw a fireball. And when he throws the dice, he ends up missing. But as we know later on, the Demogorgon's weakness is fire. So fireball becomes uh, an important story element. And then the other line that I thought was just funny was when they were trying to track down the kids and the one guy said, less athletic types go nuts for all you this <laughs> AV stuff. Yes. <laughs> Which is such an 80s thing to say. Like, Although yes. I guess it was nice that he said less athletic types. I suppose that's like maybe um, <laughs> not as mean as what he could have said right <laughs> but that does reveal something about his priorities in terms of who who the uh, the better kids are yeah or what he values yeah where the va- yeah exactly where the values are yeah now the one scene going back to jonathan and nancy that stands out to me is when jonathan has stolen his dad's gun and is practicing and can't hit anything. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then Nancy takes the gun and shoots the can on the first shot, even though technically she says she's never had experience shooting guns before. It's her um, her Sarah Connor moment, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, going back to that psychoanalytic approach, there's a lot of loaded imagery there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, who's the alpha in this scenario? He's hitting the he's hitting the spaces between. I think he, made a <laughs> he says he's aiming at the spaces to, between. Yeah, yes. to, I guess Freud may have some fun with that. Yes. So yeah. she has to take the <laughs> the gun from him, and she's the one who's yeah. able to use it. Yeah, and that's. I mean, I get, and I guess to go back to like the Freud stuff there. I mean, like, yeah. there's some fun. You know, he's sort of he's sort of point. You know, he's pointedly. I don't want to say like non-masculine, but not like feminized. Tradition. Yeah, like a feminine or more more non-traditionally mm-hmm. masculine, or, or like you know, if you think of it on a spectrum, he's yes. kind of like he's not an alpha male. Like so, based guy. on the uh, social and gender values of the time uh, of yeah. the 1980s, and then of course his you know, and his nemesis is a total alpha male yes. guy, you know, who's like playing sports and playing music, and you know, is really cool and, and all those things. And Nancy becomes much more assertive, more masculine in her behavior mm-hmm. or traditionally. And masculine. that actually is, you know, and that the interesting thing about that, I think, is that but she's like, as she begins to like have more agency for herself, then she's she seems less fixated upon Steve and this traditional dynamic. So going back to the criticism, there's a couple other approaches which are similar to or related to psychoanalysis which are archetypal criticism and then reader response. The archetypal criticism 
is based on the theories of Carl Jung, who was one of Freud's protégés, which mm -hmm. is based on the idea that uh, there is a collective unconsciousness and that certain fundamental experiences in human development are sort of encoded in our unconscious minds symbolically and they become manifest through our art and dreams through these universal symbols that are referred to as archetypes. And we've talked about archetypes or rather archetypal criticism a little bit in here before by looking at the idea of Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey and how that is represented in this particular text. As we saw in the previous episode, there are a lot of crossings of thresholds in this story, which is part of the that paradigm of the hero's journey. So the idea of the hero's journey is that you have a common person who experiences some call to adventure, which they initially uh, resist and go out, leave their community, leave the, the comforts of their home, go out into the larger world where they experience trials and challenges and obstacles that they have to overcome in order to gain a more heroic status so that they can return home with the ability to right wrongs. Yes, um, all of these parallels that we've seen in other texts with Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and so on and so forth, all examples of the hero's journey. I would bet they probably know the Joseph Campbell stuff and the Jung because, you know, they seem to have, because there's just such a deep web of references and all of this stuff yes. and it has a lot of it's put together with such care it's not slapped together they're they're probably very well versed in it and the whole hero's journey paradigm that joseph campbell wrote about in his classic work the hero with a thousand faces it's really a metaphor for growing up and going through rites of passage and that is i mean this is really a story about growing up Marxism or socioeconomic criticism based on the theories of Karl Marx. Basically, he was saying that all historical development is brought about through conflict between different classes, specifically the proletariat, which is the working class or the laboring class, and the bourgeoisie, which is the, the ruling class. We've talked about this a little bit already, class conflict or class struggle being expressed in the story. Yeah, I mean, this show is really steeped in, in this to a degree, and it, it's probably, I mean, it's probably a function of the, you know, the era that it's set in also, because there was a, a very strong class consciousness in the yes. 80s, brought about by Reagan, and yes. you know, recycled again, you know, just recently. Um, <laughs> yes. But, you know, the, the show, you know, is very matter of fact about those class differences between the buyer's family and, yes. and the others the other kids in the in the story and also just just the dynamics of what that means for them too now i wonder what you what do you what's your take on like the idea that he you know will is the the one who is you know taken away but he's the the proletariat you know or his family mm -hmm. is in the kind of like the i I, to, I think like, it's interesting they're because, the ones that are more blue collar so. right and they are are they the heroes of the story? I think each character is heroic in their own way. So I think each character goes through their own hero's journey. But yeah, one way of, of applying Marxism is to look at the text and determine if it's subverting or supporting the values of different social classes. And I don't think this text really is. Yeah. I mean, certainly we have the juxtaposition of the wheelers who are very much middle class. And then we have, as you note, the buyers who are very much the working class uh, or the proletariat. So there is a, a very obvious distinction between those two. But I don't think the story is subverting the values of the middle class or necessarily supporting those values or of the working class either. You, you don't yeah, see conflict between the classes. Good. Right. Like there's a lot of cooperation between yes. them and, and a lot of problem solving. And, you know, this is where it reminds me more because of that hero's journey element, I think, for one thing, um, you know, they're all sort of, you know, this fellowship, haha, -ha, mm -hmm. um, of, mm -hmm. of folks who are kind of working together to get this person back or 
solve this problem. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing that's interesting too, I mean, is that that group of people crosses some key demographic areas. Mm -hmm. And I think this is where perhaps the trends of conventional storytelling in, in the 2010s and, and now yeah. is, is an influence, right? You know, or I, I think mean, that's a you, good point. Because yeah. if this were made in the 80s, there would be much more obvious conflict between the classes. So if you look at Goonies, for example, go back to that sort of template. The heroes are the, the poor kids and the rich kids are the assholes, right? And, yeah, and that's, would, that is a trope that you would see repeated yeah. many times in the 80s. Yeah. And what's the triggering event that they're going to lose their home? Exactly. To build a golf course. To build a golf course. Much more, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get too much more Marxian than that, right? And that's not so much the case here. I mean, certainly Byers family, Jonathan in particular, are looked down upon by... You know, Steve and his friends who are the rich people here, but yeah. you don't get that really head to head conflict that would be much more traditional in the yeah. 80s story. Of this For time. sure. Yeah. I mean, and not just, and, and, you know, the Goonies is one example, but all of those snobs versus the slobs yes. comedies like, yes. in the 80s. I was like thinking greasers versus socias, but yeah. Yeah. Outsiders, like there's but, animal. I mean, well, Animal House is the 70s, but yeah. It really is like the you know kind of birth that whole yeah. group of comedies of yeah you know, where class is a factor and you know usually the the folks that are in the bourgeoisie are the villains. Right. Now know. we did talk about how probably Will's social class had something to do with his disappearance not really being considered much of a problem at least initially. Mm -hmm. I think if let's say one of the Wheelers had disappeared it probably would have been much been more news that night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Differential criticism is a broad term. Basically that refers to looking at the text from a perspective of a certain social group, typically a, a group that is more of a minority or has traditionally not had been in a position of power. So a uh, racial minority sexual minority, whatever the, the case may be. We've talked about feminism a little bit, or we've applied feminism in here before, but we haven't really looked at like racial issues. Yeah, there's, and I was just thinking about that a little bit. It's hard to talk about without going further into the show, because mm -hmm. I think there's some developments that are interesting and cool that happen in the one that I just finished watching, but I don't yes. want to ruin it for anybody yeah we don't really get a pointed discussion or even suggestions about racial issues until we get to the second season actually this is a predominantly white cast of characters lucas so far is really the only character of color that we see we and do we don't have much of his family at this point we either. don't we at, at this point we it. don't and in fact, in this particular episode, we see his family for the first time at the funeral. But other characters of color that we see, I can only think of two others. And that's the principal of the middle school and Officer Powell. Indiana's, I mean, I live in Indiana yeah. right now. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's pretty white. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I live in Bloomington, which is a college town. Right. So there is this kind of like surface level diversity. Yeah, I mean, it, it is small town Indiana. But, so yeah, that, yeah. that kind of makes sense. The thing that actually, there just hasn't been much. I don't feel like there's much to go on with the Afrocentric at this moment yeah. because we just haven't done yeah. much there. But I will point out that one thing that has come up a couple times is some really derogatory attitudes toward, you know, folks who might be gay or like mm -hmm. the idea that being gay is, is a bad thing to be. Right. Um, and again, not so much this season, although it does become a bigger issue or discussion point in later seasons. Also probably, you know, again, something that you might expect to see now and like a, a show being produced in, in this time more mm -hmm. so than in the 20. 1984 that's where there's a lot more of that subtext i think things that were produced in this era tend mm -hmm. to have a lot more subtext and and funny enough i mean one of the most commonly cited examples is enjoying a victory lap right this summer right uh as a coded queer film you know top guns out mm -hmm. there 
slaying the box office again. I mean, I guess you could read it like this. I mean, we weren't really, you know, those voices were really, really fighting to be heard. I would never yes. say that they're not now. Yeah, it, um, at the time, it was not something that I think was openly discussed and wasn't yeah. on most people's radar. Like in terms of films and things, I mean, it's kind of ebbed and flowed. Mm -hmm. There's there's all these great films in the 70s that, you know, where black people are making their own films and talking mm -hmm. about things that matter to them and making stories that that audience would want and without a regard for whether another in a white audience is going to care or be interested yep. whatsoever. Um, but again, not, then of course, not mainstream. And then, of course, we're, it's got nothing to do with Stranger Things, but by 1986, we are getting some Spike Lee films. Um, he's made at least two films. Keep me honest there. I feel like School Days came out in 86, which deals re oh, with a lot of like really stuff that is definitely more geared expressly toward a Black audience because it talks a lot more about differences within the Black community. And then, of course, every summer, I always think about Do the Right Thing. It's probably my favorite movie of all time. And it's unfortunately remained relevant for its entire existence. Mm -hmm. And at times has been even harder to watch in recent years. So, well, I, so there's that. And in terms um, of Black entertainment, we do start to see more of it in the 80s with BET, the advent of that. The Cosby Show was a, a really big thing. Oh, yeah, the Cosby show would have probably been the number one show on television during, like, the time that this is on right now, uh, or that we're at with Stranger Things. It's, um, and then, of course, Michael Jackson, obviously. Yes. And Prince, because we're not, or, oh, well, hold on, because we're not quite, yeah, Thriller is probably out at this point. Oh, definitely. It was, like, 1982, right? 82, 83, I'm not positive. A Purple Rain was, I'm Purple pretty sure, 83. For sure. Is it 84? Okay. Yeah, summer of 84. Okay. Um, but Prince had already made the name for himself up by that Yeah, point. he was already popular, maybe yeah. not on the scale he was about to become. But yeah, I mean, this is the point at which we were maybe starting to see a handful of Black artists on MTV, because initially MTV was not playing yes, that is true. any Black artists at all. That is um, true. You know, because, and, and because they felt that people didn't want to see them. Mm-hmm. Uh, the justification was that M MTV was primarily a rock radio station mm -hmm. and black people didn't make rock music. That was the explanation. Yeah. 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 I guess they'd never heard of Rick James. <laughs> okay. But yeah, I think it, so far kind of uh, in Stranger Things with the first season, we don't get much happening in terms of racial issues or gender issues or sexual orientation issues at this point, they do become more relevant later on in later seasons. So you, that's, that's so something throw, we're going to have to wait for, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to throw this out then. Do you mm -hmm. think that this was a deliberate choice by the, the show's makers? Because maybe if we don't dive, or we're, we're just getting allowed, we're getting the opportunity to just get to know these characters and where they're going to fit into the story. And then as we begin to learn more about mm -hmm. these individual characters, that's when we start to see some of those I, dynamics. That's a really good more question. Time, yeah, because we spend more time with Lucas as the show goes on. Yes. And then that's when we start to see where there's things that are hard for him living in that community. Right. And the kinds of choices that he has to consider. And then some other characters later in the, in the show as well. I think there are certain seeds being planted here in the first season. But yeah, I I'm not like sure. There's how a couple of offhanded references to him, like with the bullies and stuff. Do they me? I feel like maybe that's a factor in the bullying. I don't probably remember. not as much as like the kind of him being with the nerdy kids, but yeah, I think that's more um, of the issue there, or yeah. at least that's the way that I perceived it. Yeah. So it could be that just I'm not seeing it. But we're nerds. So yeah. of course that would look, stand out to us. Just the limitations of our perspective. Yeah. yeah. Well, because bullies are always going to look for whatever is different to go after. That's that's the whole premise, right? I feel like it's not any, it must not have been something so like ugly that it didn't, you know, because it surely would have stuck out in my head if they had said certain words or done something that really directly jabbed at, at Lucas being black. But I feel like there's some sort of subtle 
stuff going on in some yeah, you know, episodes. I, I think so. I, I Now that you mentioned it, I do feel like there is something there, although I can't bring anything specific to yeah, mind. Yeah, I got nothing. I, I can see the scene where they're all getting bullied in my head, but I can't mm-hmm. think of anything that anybody says. So I'm going to have to go back and take another look at yeah, that. Yeah, we'll have to dig deep on that one. Okay, and then the uh, last critical approach is deconstructionism or post-structuralism, which takes its idea that language is inherently meaningless, which it is, if you think about it. You know, language is just a series of agreements that people make in order to communicate ideas. (laughs) But the idea of deconstruction, and again, I'm massively oversimplifying these approaches. But one of the ideas of deconstruction is that language can mean whatever you want it to mean. And so you can deliberately misread a text in order to gain a greater insight into it. I don't know if you want to do any of that here. I think that our aim really with this show is is there's enough there that is contributing mm-hmm. to the meaning to play around with. Yeah. I mean, one aspect of it is intertextuality, which we have touched on quite a bit before. Yeah, it does seem, I mean, it borrows from lots of different places, yeah. but um, I mean, it's, I guess in a sense, we sort of deconstruct those, right? Yeah. Those are almost always nonverbal anyway. We're looking at these different, oh, this happened in the story right. and that reminds me of this movie or, you know, we So yeah, we have the, the these journey, references, these allusions that we are supplying greater meaning to or bringing greater understanding to the text than what is actually stated in the text speaking of which there are some allusions in this particular episode so the body which is the book on which the movie stand by me was based we get some visual references to that in this episode with the uh our our group of heroes walking along the train tracks looking for the gate and they end up in the junkyard and those are two really important scenes or visuals from that particular story. Bambi is referenced in here in a couple places <laughs> because Jonathan says he always liked Thumper as a character. And then at the end of the episode, when they're hunting for the Demogorgon, they come across a deer that they say has been hit by a car, which I'm not sure if that's actually the case, but they do come across a dying deer that the Demogorgon then feeds on. We get a, or at least I see this as a reference to E.T. when Hopper breaks into the lab and is subdued by the guys in the hazmat suits. And then we get explicit references to all the right moves and risky business. Oh my goodness, I can't remember what those are. Steve goes to Nancy's house where she is practicing with a baseball bat. And he says, hey, you want to go see a movie? You know, All the Right Moves is still playing. And then, you know, you, how much you like risky business. And he compares himself to Tom Cruise. I cannot believe I didn't notice that. I heard that <laughs> didn't jump out at me. That's hilarious. We get a reference to Carl Sagan and Cosmos. Yeah, and Hugh Everett. And the many worlds interpretation. This is where we get into uh, our discussion of the upside down or where the upside down gets introduced and the whole concept Mm -hmm. that there are are other alternate realities. By Mr. Clark, who is one of my favorite characters. Yeah, Mr. Clark is fun. A couple incidents of foreshadowing. Uh, We talked about fireballs earlier, but there's the point where Lucas says of Eleven, have you thought that maybe she's the monster? And of course, the next episode is called The Monster, and it's all about the Demogorgon. Again, drawing a parallel between Eleven and these other figures, because she is very much tied to the Demogorgon, as we come to understand later on. Mm -hmm. The music of this episode, we have old-time rock and roll. So the Bob Seger song, which was featured in Risky Business, Steve starts singing parts of that. Yep. And then in the end credits, we get Echo and the Bunny Men in Nocturnal Me. I, I mean, we've talked about like their kind of quote unquote basic Ooh. choices in music. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, a few times I've sort of taken them to task for that. I probably mm-hmm. would be listening to records with Jonathan if it was if I was in the show. Right. But uh, I mean, Glenn and Jonathan would probably be kicking it, listening to <laughs> Joy Division and Who's Do and all that stuff. I, there's probably a reason for that. I, I'm just, it's escaping me. Like why outside of it being in that movie, but 
of course that song is not like you know was not new at that time either no it wasn't so it's probably the reason steve knows it is the movie uh, I, I think you probably would be familiar with bob seeger yeah prior to this but yeah it was certainly a popular song at the time it, it had a yeah. sort of renewed popularity because of that movie mm -hmm. i mean nocturnal me the just the you know the title of it is just feels like it fits this show so perfectly with you know these different and, and i'm not there. really that familiar with echo and the bunny man really the song i know uh, i'm most familiar with is their cover of people are strange from the lost boys mm -hmm. so yeah this wasn't the song that i really knew and they were pretty popular it's it's actually not a group that i listen to a ton of either mm -hmm. and i'm quite sure that the first time i remember hearing them was the people are strange cover too because I was obsessed with the Lost Boys, so. <laughs> but they're certainly a band that has a lot of esteem from that era. This is where yes. we need on the podcast. He'd, he'd yeah. tell all about it. He could tell. Oh, you he probably would. About. Yeah. Maybe they're there for a contrast in a sense because that definitely feels like a song that Jonathan would probably mm -hmm. like. Probably Steve would not know what it is. <laughs> and the song itself is very sort of surreal in terms of the lyrics. Yeah, but there, again, it's it, all darker stuff that is evocative of the ending of this episode and yeah, kind of moving into the upside down yeah i mean that it, it does seem to be setting us up for where it's going to go from and they have used the music to such you know impressive effect in a lot of the other shows it, nothing you know I, I don't think i i'm of the belief that none of these things are kind of haphazardly placed oh yeah so. nothing's accidental here yeah Okay. Uh, any other points you want to make about this episode? Stick with it if you're watching it for the first time. This is not one of the better episodes. Don't yeah, give up. This, <laughs> yeah, like I said, it's not my favorite episode. It's one where nothing much really actually happens, but we do have a, a several important key concepts are brought up. We get uh, a lot of insights into characters, I think. That's really what this episode is, how this episode is functioning in the story, yeah. is to give us an interlude where we learn more about the characters. So it's more character-driven yeah. than plot-driven. Okay, Certainly. and then for our next episode, the homework is Rambo and <laughs> Chapter 6, The Monster. Oh, I can't wait to do some Rambo stuff. So oh, yeah, I, and speaking of the new historicism, yeah, we'll get into that when we get to Rambo, because how it was interpreted then versus now. Yeah. Oh, man. Wide well, even, changes. yeah. Well, even the way it has, its evolution, even in that time frame, is interesting. That is true. Yeah, if you look at the first movie in relation to the second, and especially the third. Oh it's my quite word! A difference there. Yeah, but that's for next time. So that'll that'll if that doesn't pique your interest. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything you want to say or promote? Anything new? I no, I'm in a work mode right now. I'm working on an article that I'm hoping to get published someplace. Maybe not even in the magazine that I normally write for. That's kind of like the backup plan if I can't get it somewhere else. I'm doing an article about the movies of Todd Solons, which has nothing to do with the 80s at all. It's a 90s thing. And then I'm also, I mean, I my task for the summer is a couple of new pieces for the Words and Music Club that I write for the website. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm kind of in a work mode right now. I don't have anything, okay. anything to show for currently. <laughs> That's fair. Okay. Well, thanks for joining me again. Thanks for listening. And until next time, Stay strange. Stranger Things in the 1980s is produced by Dread Pirate Productions. Cover art is by Sherry Archer. The theme music is Cobalt by Alex Bloxham, used under license from Filmstrip. Send questions or topic suggestions to Dread Pirate Productions at gmail.com.